The Fountain of Tears is a sculptured dialogue of suffering between the crucifixion and the Holocaust. The Fountain of Tears is a wall, 60 feet long and 12 feet high. It has seven panels made of Jerusalem stone and six pillars of field stones. Facing each one of the panels are seven life-size bronze figures. The title, The Fountain of Tears, is taken from a verse in the Bible from the book of Jeremiah. The prophet is crying out to God, O Lord, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears that I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. The seven panels are high relief sculptures, each depicting a different crucifixion scene. Each crucifixion panel relates to each one of the last seven statements spoken by Jesus in the last moments of his life. The six pillars of stones act as dividers between each of the seven panels. These pillars represent a memorial to the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. The seven bronze figures symbolize a Holocaust survivor his head is shaved and he is dressed in the striped clothes of the concentration camp. Each figure is responding and identifying to each word spoken from the crucifixion. There is also water that very slowly trickles over the pillars of stones, symbolizing the tears from the cry of Jeremiah. The water from each of the pillars is channeled out of the courtyard to irrigate six olive trees. At the south end of the courtyard is a sculpture called Gethsemane. This depicts the struggle over the cup of suffering, the beginning of the crucifixion. At the opposite end of the courtyard are two sculptures, the butterfly and the empty cup, both symbolizing resurrection. All of these elements come together to tell a story, to relate a possibility, to ask a question. Could the crucifixion and the Holocaust have something in common with each other's pain? Now it has been said over and over again historically that the suffering of the crucifixion actually created the suffering for the other, the Jewish people, in the Holocaust. So it is important to understand the process of artistic creation in this work in order to understand its communication. The artist has taken these last seven words of Jesus and has done a creative meditation on each one to see if there is identification which would somehow connect the two. The artist, Rick Winicky, is originally Canadian he came to Israel as a 21-year-old drawn by his fascination with the rising of the Jewish state out of the ashes of the Holocaust. He sees himself as a believer in Jesus and has lived in Israel now for over 30 years. He deeply understands the conflict of the crucifixion and the Holocaust that he has brought together in this work. first session this morning, we stopped it at the prayer just before this last frame, where the focus was on the word payback. 
went through the whole process of how, how the Lord birthed this whole work through this prophetic word, touching, touching the position of payback. But on this time, I wanted to come to the final image. I love that little butterfly. This was not a photoshopped effort. The olive trees that are planted just outside of the courtyard, the tears represented in the water over the six pillars that represent the memorial to the six million. But there was something within the process, years into this, that the Lord kept on saying, there has to be a representation of payback visually also. We started this in 2001, and in 2008, we ended up planting six olive trees just outside of the courtyard. And the Lord, in his genius, it's fantastic working with him, because it's like you, the artist gets way more credit than, than you deserve, for sure. Because at one point in time, I was trying to figure out how to do the tears representing the water going over the stones. And I know there's mechanisms in order to do that. That, you know, I was trying, I'm burning brain cells, trying to figure out how to actually make it work. But at one point, the Lord said to me while I was doing this, just look down, just look down. And I'm like, Okay, you know, so I look down in the courtyard where the fountain is, there's a very gentle slope that goes away from the face of the fountain. And all of a sudden I realized that the water wouldn't be recycled, that the, each one of the pillars and the water from each one of the pillars would be channeled out and that it would become then the food for the trees that would be planted on the outside. And so the essence, which is like genius, it's like when we have a group to come and see the fountain, we turn the water on. So in a sense, the tears, the representation of the tears prophetically cried out by Jeremiah, are activated, in a sense, by the groups that have come in order to see the fountain. And when we planted these trees, they were like shoelaces. The, like, I don't know anything about gardening. I went to the local greenhouse. The guy there I know fairly well, so I knew he wasn't going to, like, rip me off or anything. And so I bought the six olive trees with these little bamboo supports. Well, the tree was actually thinner than the bamboo support. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is the Negev desert. We, we do rocks really well, but nothing else grows. It's like, it's completely, we call it an unobtrusive view. There's no trees in the way. There's nothing in the way at all. You see the whole line of the land. So when you plant six olive trees within that kind of an environment, it's intentional. They make a mark. And so the trees, in the end, they were just so small that when a close friend came, she's a documentarian, and she came with a camera guy, and we started to do some serious footage on the fountain. During the course over a few days, he walked outside and saw, saw this little butterfly. And it's like, it's like, it was incredible, the moment, and the capturing of it. Because it's the trees represent the payback. The tears prophetically over the memory of six million Jews that were systematically killed. During the Holocaust, this is channeled, and I look at it totally as an intercession. The tears are birthed usually in a place of quiet where it's only between you and the Lord. The message 
is birthed within this hidden place. And so the waters carried underground, which was like a massive job in itself to bury these pipes, but to carry it then out to each one of the trees. The sense that we've had, I had no intention that this would be open to the public. Again, it was a, a hope of self-preservation, for sure. But we've had now over 20,000 people. We've had almost, we've had nations show up that I've never heard the name of before. And it's like, it becomes an interaction of the nations examining that place of suffering, that place of intimacy that the father shows towards the son who he takes the cup and drinks and goes to the crucifixion. But his own identification within that walk of suffering that has the ability to align itself and identify itself to the deepest place of suffering which was the Holocaust for the Jewish people. It's like, it's incredible. It's totally incredible. But this as an intercession, this was what was made really clear in the beginning, that the response of responding to even doing this work, which was like a huge struggle, that this was his tears this was the heart of the father over both these sons poured out. I describe it as an emotional minefield. It's like in presenting to groups over the first couple of years, because we didn't make it, we didn't make it public. And in a sense, I wanted to keep it as a secret intercession, but again, it's like self-preservation was the motive behind that. Lord just overruled that completely. And people started to come. And in the describing of what was there within the work, he would always download stuff while I'm in the middle of trying to relate. And I'd get choked every time. You begin to realize his heart towards this land and towards this people like has no bottom to it. It's like it was unbelievable. For me in the entire process, the lion, the whole sense, I related the same thing this morning that the sense of this payback and this prophetic word, the prophetic word is this is the year of payback. This is the year of unprecedented grace and favor. I am going to pay back everything that has been ravaged against you, everything that the locust has taken, all of these things. And when the Lord started to align this over the next year to the Holocaust and the darkness of the Holocaust, and then coupling it together with the crucifixion of Jesus was like, was totally insane. It was a wild ride. But the thing that struck me, and it's becoming more and more clear to me, especially within these last couple of days, just how incredibly significant the lion is. Because birthed out of that same interaction, in that same word, the whole processing, in a sense, to create the lion the lion came first. And hidden within the mane of the lion was the first time I had ever done a crucifixion and a reference to the Holocaust together in a piece of work. But it was almost creating a foundation for what was going to the Lord, what the Lord would unveil within the touching, going towards the fountain. Now, if we can get pictures of the lion up there, that would be really good. Got to change it? Oh, wow. Okay. Is it, is it a possibility of dimming the lights a little bit? Or I might have to wear sunglasses. Okay. 
basically what we're looking at generally here is a lion, all right? Lion of Judah, but going vertical with the roar. The lion is sitting on 12 stones because in the very beginning, I felt like the intercession is birthed out of the connection to the 12 tribes. This is the lion of Judah, so it focuses specifically on the tribe of Judah and the prophetic word attached to Judah, but also the birthing of the king. So the sense within this piece is that the intercession has to go vertical, has to cry out. The head of the lion is back, the mouth is open, and it's roaring. Now, if we can get a closer detail within the main, that would be really good. Okay. You might not see it totally clearly, but it'll be enough there for you to examine the lion himself, because he's in on the other side of the wall. I, when I was starting to do the sketches for the head of the lion, you're... When I'm drawing, sometimes I get into a whole different space. And I get lost, and I'm drawing. And I started to, what I would say completely unintentionally, I started to sketch in the middle of the lion, which is hard to see, but it's a crucifixion. I'm playing with the hair and the lion, and there's lines there, and I'm seeing things within the lines that I'm sketching. And I'm, for whatever reason, because in a sense, you're drawing. It's, you have a long gap before you actually start to touch the clay, and you start to try and pull this earth this into a three-dimensional state. So I, I'm sketching, and I, I, I started to do the crucifixion, interwoven within the lion. Didn't have any idea why, but I was like, I'm feeling the presence of the Lord while I'm drawing, and I'm like in this zone. So you have the focus interwoven because I want it seen and not seen. What if we can shift just a little bit to the left... Good. Oh, perfect. Just to the left of the lion, what you have is an impression of an Orthodox Jew holding, embracing the Torah scrolls. All right? Because I want it seen, and I don't want it seen, but he's embracing the scrolls before him over his heart. But what you're seeing in the background is a repetition of the figure. You're seeing the head, and as it goes deeper into the main, it gets less and less distinguished, say. What it represents is expulsions. The expulsions within European history for the Jewish people, they were always, there, there's only one country in Europe now, which is Poland, which was a lot of persecution, a lot of memory, a lot of history for the Jewish people, almost a thousand years Jewish presence. Poland is incredibly significant, hugely as a nation, incredibly significant. Every other European history had a community of Jews that a lot of times in the beginning were invited to come in order to raise the economy in a lot of cases within these countries. And then at a certain point in time, primarily because of the church, they were persecuted and expelled. And the final thing that was taken in their expulsion, the thing most precious to them was these Torah scrolls. And so this line, say, to the left, of the crucifixion represents the multiple expulsions within their history and within their memory. 
If we go down the main, right underneath where this, this picture is, there's a menorah. OK, if we can turn it. No, keep going, because it has to be facing down. Yeah, just like that. I've always used, I use the motif of the menorah a lot. Because the menorah for me represents a position, a geographical position of the temple. It is that ultimate symbol of spiritual rightness for the Jewish people. It's the temple. It's the article of the temple. If you have seen in historic, there's an ark in Italy called the Ark of Titus. Titus was the Italian general that completely destroyed Jerusalem. And as an honor towards him as a Roman general, there's this gigantic stone arch that's in Rome, very close to the Colosseum in Rome. And the motif, the relief that's carved on the top of the arch are a picture of Jewish slaves carrying the articles of the temple back to Rome as a show of the final destruction of the Jews within their land, the, the beginning, in a sense, of the diaspora. But what's really strong in the relief is the menorah. And when I use the menorah as something interwoven into the lion, the menorah is upside down. Because it represents, to me, a menorah that's upside down is the diaspora of the Jewish people. It is not in its right place. It is not positioned properly. It's there, but it's under a place in a sense of judgment on the Jewish people because the dispersion out of the land is the deepest place of judgment for who they are as a nation. That you really have to get. Dispersion out of the land, the deepest place of judgment against them as a nation. Because the birthing of Israel as a nation in 1948 carries huge significance. On that kind of a backdrop, this is the father now turned towards them. This is his now his favor towards them. Because they're a nation, in order for his promises to be fulfilled towards them. His promises are connected to a nation. They have to be a nation. They have to be within a geographical space that completely belongs to them. This is why it's a mark. The nation itself is the biggest prophetic mark ever. Since the time of Jesus giving himself and the, his prophetic utterance of the destruction of Jerusalem itself, the idea of the Jewish people back in their own land, and in 1967, the wholeness of the heart of the country coming back into Jewish hands, which is Jerusalem. It's incredible. And it's all there. It is so, it is so him. He is so faithful to himself, to a to a nation and a son that can't even spell the word sonship, he is faithful to himself as father. His most intimate description of who he is is father. And he displays himself under their most tragic, their most tragic moment, their most, the deepest place of vulnerability of who they are as a people coming out of the brokenness of the Holocaust. When you talk repetitively out of coming out of chaos into a place of life, it's like night, end of the Holocaust, 1945, and three years later, the nation is birthed. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable in the natural, but in the supernatural, within the relational context of God the Father to the Son that he is now going to redeem and fulfill all of his promises towards them as a nation, it makes complete sense. It totally is him. 
But within this cry, the menorah is still representing the diaspora. Now, if we go to the other side of the lion, this would be the back side. Okay, good. Now we need to turn it so it's vertical. Oh, sorry. Uh, can we turn it so it's vertical? Yeah, great. Now, can we just shift? We'll save this one for the last, and then we'll shift back to the one that you showed me first. Yeah, and if we can make that vertical, I have to do everything with my hands. It's like, <laughs> it's scary to watch if you've been videoed and stuff. Oh, I had friends one time do this thing of me talking to a group, and they did music and fast forwarded it. It's nuts. It looked like I was doing these karate moves all over the place. But it's like with Israelis, we can't talk. If you tie our hands together, forget it. I, th I think that's connected to Italians too. This now is just to the right of the crucifixion. What this represents isn't This is an open crematorium, all right? This is where the bodies, now we're entering into the aligning with the Holocaust. You've got an open crematorium, but coming out of the chimney are six very surreal figures that are almost coming out of this chimney and going interwoven into the mane of the lion and going down over the, what I began to realize was the heart. It's the heart of the lion. This the sense of the six million being poured out of this chimney is like, is, is the most intimate, is the most painful part for the father. This is like something that he had to allow. It had to be allowed somehow in order to birth this nation. But I look at it and I've and constantly thought of this, that God is king. He has created a kingdom with laws that he as king has to abide within these laws himself. But when he brings judgment and when he brings this sense of correction, he brings it as a father. He brings it with tears. He raises up an intercession that would cry out to him and say, Lord, stop this, please. Bring about your will. And in a sense, everything he does within a judgment, he brings it as father, and it's bathed in tears. It's like any father you want to you want to so get the attention of your son when he's out of control and you want him to come back into a place of an understanding of a relationship with you. And you have to do such things in order to get his attention, but always the hope of the father is a restoration of relationship with him. It's always the thing that drives his heart. And when he has to turn his back, like it says in Isaiah, I turn my back in anger for a moment. I completely believe that when God turns his back, removes grace for a moment, men become truly who they are. And world war starts. We start to kill each other, and within a moment where God has to turn his back, 
55 million people can be taken off the planet, like World War II. So I look at this, I want you to see here, there are six very elongated, surrealistic figures coming out of the chimney that flow over that part of the mane of the lion right here. But you'll see close to the upper right side, there's a very small figure. The small figure, exactly. The small figure represents the children. A million and a half Jewish children. A million and a half. For me, that's the deepest place of the wound. When you look at the fountain, when we have Israelis that come, they are in a place of such deep tension. They have told us you've taken the two hardest things in our history and you put them at the same table. And they walk through the seven last words of the person of Jesus that for them is such a hyper-negative image and memory. And you see the struggle. And you, you feel the sense of he's identified to us. You have made him one of us, which has been said to me over and over again. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but you begin to realize that within that statement, all of a sudden there's a thought that has never happened before within their thinking that it's a question to something that has been a fixed stronghold in who they are as Jews, that if they would utter a question or a, you've made him one of us, pointing at the crucifixion. And it's like all of a sudden you know that the heart of the Father has now confronted uh, uh, this this place of stronghold with a question. And that's when we tell people we're trying to create questions. The answer is only found within the Father. The questions are created in what you're seeing. Search him out. Search him out. But when they come to the child in the crematorium, the butterfly piece, it's like, it all, it becomes like this equalizer for Israelis. Because it's the deepest place of suffering within the Holocaust. is the child within the crematorium. But it's also the deepest place of hope. Is the arm of the child going through the closed crematorium door, clutching a small, tiny piece of geography that is Israel, the land. Their biggest place of fulfillment of relationship back to the heart of the Father as a nation within their own land, but it's coupled together with the deepest place of tragedy, which is the million and a half Jewish children. That's why the butterfly is so significant in the last thing, because it's the butterfly within that piece that takes flight that the child can't see. It's, uh, it's wild. These six figures are all surreal. They're all flowing out of the chimney and going down. And for me, in doing this drawing, again, it's, it's like it came as a suddenly, completely unexpected. But again, when the Lord is there, and you're not sure what's going on. I know I'm talking to the choir here with you guys for sure. And you can't identify it, but you're willing to go with it. And you start to go with it, and you don't have any idea where you're going, and you're hoping, praying for prophetic hindsight. Because that's usually the best prophetic out there. 
This becomes then the cry of the lion. This becomes the intercession. This is the closest part that touches his heart and cries. I look at it and I thought, when, when the drawing was done on this and it started to expand then into the clay, it was like, it was wild. You start to see the earthing of something that you're responding to that you know the moment belongs to the Lord. You know he was there. You know he was present. But as a sculptor, it makes it easier, the earthing, especially if you work in a water-based clay. You're dealing with the dirt, basically. It's the most incredible part of the entire process because the clay gives itself more than any other part, more than any other material within the process as it works through into the bronze. But the final thing that I want to relate within the lion is in doing the work here now, you're cutting stone. For about three days, I went back to Lynn and Mitch's place. I felt like somebody dumped a bag of flour on my head. It's like, I'm not into Rastos, but you put the face mask on, you put the rubber deal, and your hair goes out like this, and it's caked with stone dust from cutting the stones to put them in shape. But I started to realize the bits of stones that were left, because of Steve's word, this birthing out of chaos, I started to play with the broken bits of stone that in the overall picture, I'm thinking I may have them as a base to the 12 stones. Because I'm thinking it's the nations. It's a representation of a brokenness within the nations until they align themselves to the will of the Father in touching the nation, the, the firstborn. Because this is the struggle that's on the planet now. You can hardly go to Europe now. Most Israelis can't wear Stars of David. They're very, very careful about speaking Hebrew out loud. It's like, it's really dangerous. I do a lot of traveling in Europe, and I'm seeing, you feel the anti-Semitism around you, and it's this whole possessing of a vacuum of Islam within Europe right now. Germany had a vacuum because of the Holocaust. There were 500,000 Jews before the war. That vacuum was created, and now there's 800,000 Muslims all living in. And I mean, there is such a deep anti-sentiment. It's not anti-Zion. It's not anti-Semitism anymore. It's anti-Zionism. And it's like, this is the aligning of the nations. This is why I think it's so prophetic. The idea of the healing ministry guys and all the guys that are connected to the nations. Because the only healing the nations are going to have is they have to have a right alignment towards this nation. Have to. The final thing that I want you to know, because Steve mentioned it also, is that we're now in the process of doing a copy of the Fountain of Tears 300 meters from the gates of Birkenau, all right? Auschwitz. Birkenau records a little over a million Jews that were killed specifically in Birkenau, which was the killing part of Auschwitz. It's the Golgotha of the Jewish people. There were six main killing camps. All of them were in Poland. The worst was Auschwitz because it was the best designed. It had all the intention of killing, the potential of five, four crematoriums within Birkenau was created in the spring of 1942. January of 42 is when the SS the Nazis within the movement decided on the final solution for the Jewish people, which was to be gassing 
and burning of the bodies. The spring created Auschwitz. Birkenau Auschwitz was created in the spring of 1942. It's significant to remember that date. Because 70 years later, which 70 carries huge significance from a prophetic biblical sense, 2012, which is 70 years later, after they've decided and earthed and to a degree fulfilled their dreams within Auschwitz ended up killing two-thirds of the Jewish population within Europe. 2012, the nation of Israel, not just the ethnic group that survived the devastation of the Holocaust, but the nation of Israel in 1948 started with 600,000 Jews struggling against millions of Arabs all poised in order to finish what had started in the Holocaust was that. That was their cheer, basically. But in 2012, the first time in Israel's history, the Jewish population of Israel came to six million. Six million. The whole sense of the number in the payback word. 2001, the Lord is hammering this prophetic word that I'm going to take the number six million that represents the number of death and I'm going to turn it into a number representing life. And I'm walking, I'm trying to walk through the fountain with this payback word. In 2008, right after we planted these trees, I get this word, I'm in the courtyard, I'm doing stuff. And I felt like the Lord said to me, pay close attention to 2012. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's 2008. I better write myself a note because I'll forget for sure. And after you've lived in Israel this long, you've heard so many prophetic predictions that attaches itself to a date, and always there's going to be a war that starts on this date, and then it's whether it's all the end time stuff, which I, to a large degree, I won't get into, but I have a hard time with. But it's, so I don't listen to date stuff very closely. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I. I felt like this was the Lord. Pay attention, 2012. All this stuff. So, okay, if I remember, I'll try my best. And I'm thinking, if it's the Lord, he's going to remind me for sure. Because there'll be a lot of stuff that happens in four years. The number goes to 6 million Jews in 2012. The fall, November of 2012, we buy a piece of property that is 300 meters from the gates of Birkenau. Again, if you want to know all the details, got to get the book, all right? But one of the things that happened in the three years then, it marked 70-year memorials from 2012 up until 2015, which was the end of World War II. Internationally, the day of memorial is marked by the liberation of Auschwitz because Auschwitz is the most famous out of all the camps. All the nations gathered, diplomats, dignitaries, at the gates of Birkenau. They completely covered it in this gigantic tent. They did this day of memorial on the 27th of January, 2015, marking a 70-year marker as the end of World War II, liberation of Auschwitz. Daphne and I, my wife, we've been invited to be, I, I, for three years from 2012, I've been every month, just about every month in Poland. The next step, the next step. The building that we're building is about 80% done. I've had to do all kinds of wacky and way out things, carrying portions of bodies in, in, out of wax casting them in Poland, the entire wall of the fountain, they had to make a mold of every single block in 27 big, huge boxes. I had to send a copy in wax 
to pull into a little Pentecostal church right in the town, who the pastor's a really good friend, and did all of these molts. So it's been three years of like doing really wild things, but the word the Lord kept on speaking was that there will be no delays, no delays. And when I'm begging for delays, he's like, no delays. <laughs> Honestly, and this is really bad, bringing up Abraham, I always pray the Abraham prayer during this time. I don't know whether that's even a, a real deal or not, but for me, it was really real. I kept on saying to the Lord, which was like, I think it's awful. But I kept praying, and I'm asking the Lord, Stop the knife. Stop the knife. I'm, I want to get credit for obeying you, but not actually having to do it. This was Abraham and Isaac. He fully intended to sacrifice the son. He took it. He prepared everything. But just before he drove the knife in, the Lord sent the angel and basically said, well done. My entire, for like a terrible amount of time, I kept asking the Lord, just send the angel. Stop this thing. Give me credit for what I'm willing to do, but I don't have to totally do it. <laughs> that was like my biggest desire. But the Lord kept saying, no delays. <laughs> he just doesn't agree with us sometimes. <laughs> But in 2015, when all the nations were gathering basically 300 meters up from where the building was, and I mean, it was still under construction, sheathed off with OSB, six days before Daphne and I left to go, and she's always, she's fantastic, she's always hoping that we'll finally go someplace with normal bags, <laughs> not carrying weird stuff. Always overweight, oversized, always begging mercy and favor of whoever you go through the process, which generally we get a ton of favor. But I, I'm coming back from Jerusalem, and I felt like the Lord said, I want the building marked. This is a marking of 70 years to the nations. I want that building marked. And it was so strong, the impression of the Lord. He started giving me things. I'm thinking, oh, no, this is more than one. I might have to make a list. So I pulled the car over, and he said to me, I want the lion. I want the verses out of Jeremiah. Oh, Lord, that my head is a spring of water, my eyes a fountain of tears, that I would weep day and night. I want these words on the outside of the building, and they have to be in Hebrew and only in Hebrew. And I want the lion. And on the 27th of January, I want the Israeli flag on the outside of the building, which you have to understand the context of putting the flag in a little Polish village 300 meters from, out from the gates is like, that was really hard. And I'm thinking, the lion? How in the world? I got four days before we leave. How am I going to, what, what do you mean? I was working on a life-size lion called the Vengeance of the Lamb, which is going to go in the front of the building by itself. But I'm thinking, Lord, there's no, there's no way. There's no way. And you know, the lion, the lion. And I went back and I'm thinking, oh, no. The lion that's in the other room, I have a mold of it. I haven't gone near the mold for like a long time. I'm thinking, okay, well, if I can find it, and I'm not going to tell Daphna right away. <laughs> the Lord was fine with that. I found the mold. I cast it in a special white stone because it casts fast. It's almost like a plaster stone thing together. I cast the entire lion in pieces. I made the weirdest looking carry-on bag you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> life. Weighed a ton. I had to carry it. I could carry it about 10 meters, and then I had to rest. Every single time. Nobody saw it. 
Nobody, nobody said squat. In the whole process, I couldn't believe it. I walked right by all the security. When they asked you to weigh sometimes your carry-on bag, it was probably 50 kilos. And they allow you 10. And they never saw it. We're schlepping this thing. I got a rope and this funky handle that I created to try and carry it. It was all squeezed together. And it's just, we got it, get it in the carry-on. It was like doing a bench press to get it above my head and slide it into the deal. It's nuts. We end up getting there. Daphne was great. We sat in a little rented room. We put together on the wood all the Hebrew. We put it up on the wall. And the lion now has been on the outside as a marker to the building. So I want you guys to know what you've got here. In this church, there is a direct link to the fountain, what is going on in Birkenau, but it is the intercession. It is the cry for the salvation of Israel as a nation. Yeah. It is totally that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Lord, you are so incredibly kind. Lord, that you would deal with material that so resists you. Lord, a material that is so hard to work sometimes. Lord, we thank you for your fruit of the Spirit, that you show so much patience and long-suffering, Lord with each one of us. Lord, we ask that somehow you know each one of us as your children. Lord, that you would give us that portion that we can carry. Lord, the desire of your heart is what we want to see fulfilled. Lord, oh Lord, and it's scary to say it. But Lord, we don't care what it takes within our lives. Lord, we so trust you as Father. Lord, we ask that you would remove any hindrance within our own lives, Lord, to fulfill your will. Lord, that you would touch this nation. Lord, you so intend to do this. Lord, we just have to bring our heart into a place of agreement with you. Lord, you fully intend to restore, to pay back. Lord, this is all within your hands. This is all your promises. Lord, that you would keep us in a place of being awake. Lord Jesus, when you were in Gethsemane, those closest to you couldn't stay awake. Lord, we pray that this time, Father, that we would be awake. Lord, that we would just be with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your kindness towards us, Lord. I pray for your blessing over this congregation, Lord. I pray, Lord, that there would be such a deep intercession that would come out of this place. Lord, the nations, the healing, all of these things that are so representational in this place, Lord, I pray that you bring it into a complete fulfillment. Lord, earth it. Give us what we can carry, Lord. Father, earth your will, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We're going to um, 
those of you that are part of the healing ministries and nations, I'm going to ask you, you'll be able to kind of make your way up here. Because I do think what we, when we see the Lord with Israel, then we also understand him with individuals. And, and the whole of the move of God through the earth is to touch the earth through his priests, his kings and priests that he's redeemed now out of every tribe and people, nation, tongue. And uh, I, I just would like to, it'll take me three minutes and you're all free to go in any direction you feel led to go. But if I could get the, those who helped during this triumphant voice to come up and fill the front so I can have a point of contact. I'd like to also place a few offering buckets on either at the sta stairs of either side of the platform so those who have been uh, moved and touched by Rick's ministry could sow into that if you haven't had a chance as of yet. And then I would like to just release a blessing, a Father's blessing, on all of us in our journey. Um, because th there's just something really, they're not here, they're not going to get there. You, they won't, they're on, at, the, at the stairs because they'll be blocked by these people. Thank you. few more of you just yeah we got a couple more spots here thank you all right stand up with me please I just uh, you know it's just good to know Jesus and I don't want to I don't need to take any more of your time you're pre well prepared to receive what God has for you but let it be said that inside of you is a destiny that was given to you in Christ before the foundation of the world before time began God knew you and foreknew you, and predestined setting your boundaries so that you might become, and I might become, and we might become conformed to the image of his son, the firstborn of many creations. If, as we see it for a nation, for by his son, we were given this access to a family. Father found a family by giving up his son. And we are that family being transformed into that image. From that foreknowledge that was setting a course of predestination, the Father determined that by Holy Spirit and through the heralding of the Christ of what he accomplished, we would be called out of wherever we found ourselves when the calling came. And we would respond and say, Jesus, yes, I believe you died for my sin come into my life. We would invite, we would welcome, we would honor, and we would be born again, and we would be saved, believers, to begin a journey immediately justified for eternity, never for that to be in question, because we are never to be out of Christ. In Christ, we are inseparable in union and oneness. Though the accuser would test us, we would learn to trust in what Christ accomplished, and his blood would be our answer. From there, immediately, we were glorified, yet to be discovered what that looks like. But now we know that when we behold him, we'll be like him, so we have a hope. And we're expectant that that one day will be seen upon the planet. The revelation of Jesus Christ in his church will awaken nations to come alive again. Then, immediately at that moment, we were brought into union and never to be separated from the love of God, no matter what was to come against us, health or wealth, destruction, loss, confusion, rejection. We were to be a people, sons and daughters, justified, glorified, and in union, inseparable from love. Knowing, Father, knowing well that each of us would walk through our own journey and discover our own setbacks, confusions, we would retreat, we would lose our place, we would be hurt, we would be wounded, we would have questions more than we had answers, and yet we would keep finding the touch of heaven, and we would come respond again to his voice, and we'd grow, and we'd not stop the journey, because that suffering, which is living life in agreement with God on a planet that is an absolute resistance to God, 
Just as they did not receive Jesus, we are not received in many of our lives. We don't understand it because it always gets so convoluted. But in that journey toward the Lord, hearing his voice, he would keep beckoning us, maturing us, and growing us. And we have this hope that as we suffer, so shall we be glorified. That he is our life, and when he appears, we will appear with him in glory. I believe that's the hope of heaven. That's the plan of salvation. That's the eternal purposes. When Israel comes into the awakening, of this, that will release us from life from the dead. It will be the glor most glorious. And watch the two happen. And the contention over Israel is the same contention over the name of our Lord Jesus in any corner of the earth and the power and person of Holy Spirit. So I want to release the blessing to us that that dream of Father will be fulfilled in us, every one of us. And then we can go forward knowing that, okay, these are moments that become memorials and we can re return to them and grow in them, but we're all going with him. And no matter where we find ourselves now, God is calling us alive. He's calling us out. He's calling us forward. He's calling us to continue on. And there's a grace now to start the next season, to the next season of the journey with Jesus, whatever life means, individually, collectively, and I believe there's going to be a grace that you're going to walk out of here today. You're going to walk out of here with an upgrade of Holy Spirit. I mean, you're going to get on a not. It's not just a better seat on the plane. It's a new plane. You're going to get a. There's going to be an upgrade in your audio visual system. You're going to hear better and see better and grasp and understand mystery better of what Christ is doing. And there is going to become a new power for you to live, for he, the one who is the witness giver, Jesus is the answer, Holy Spirit's the broadcaster, and he's going to empower us in a new life with, new, with a new story, with a new song, with a new sense of hope. That's what I want to bless you with, the upgrade of both, of, of all of Holy Spirit, of all of this sound, of all of this identity and clarity and brilliance and witness and experience of Jesus and the ability to carry that sound to other people. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have saw fit and ordained these last five days together to establish even more as a marker in our spirit and in our building and in our hearts your deep commitment to your people and your absolute certainty of completion to all your promises. But I also thank you that we are the fragmented nations that you collected, and you came with us in mind just as well, that Israel, Christ, has always been the hope of all the nations. So now I ask you, Heavenly Father, for you know where our origins are from. Whether we are Jewish or Gentile, you know our point of beginning, which all goes back to Adam, and you know the promise you gave, and you know, knew us from before foundation of the world that goes all the way back to Jesus. And you set in motion a plan, a beautiful mosaic that would depict glory and the image of God in the face of man. And so now, Lord, I ask you, Holy Spirit, by the power of Jesus Christ, by the gift that you became to us because of Christ's successful assignment of resurrection, that you would upgrade your presence in every one of us. You would come into our makeshift carry-ons and carry us on. You'd pick us up and lift us up and move us to the future that you have ordained for us to possess. You would awaken us from the slumber or the setbacks, from the discouragements and the despondency, from betrayals and losses. You would just come and just pull us up and bring us forward. And in so doing, you would open our eyes to see, like you did for Isaiah, and ears that could hear again, and a heart that could perceive. And all of a sudden, all that we've just been through, like Joseph, we could immediately go, no, this wasn't what I thought it was. This is what God wanted it to be for. And instead of sorrow, we would have joy. Instead of hopelessness, we would begin to be the ones who carry more hope to the earth than they've ever heard before. Instead of captivity, we would be liberators in the freedom and even in the point of where our captivity once held us. There would be grace and mercy and joy. And Lord God, that in this moment of time, that you, Holy Spirit, would fill us 
and carry us and empower us. And that, Jesus, you would be glorious. And we would behold you in all of history and behold you now as you approach time. And you would fill us and make the witness of yourself be ever present and not the pressure of ourselves to prove anything because, Holy Spirit, you get to be the testifier, witness, empowerer, lover, life giver. So, God, though we cannot, though we have failed, though we have not been able to live up to what we thought we would see or do, you are more than able to bring resurrection life and the fulfillment of what you saw and what you committed yourself to do. So, Lord, fill us, bless us, bless Rick, bless any offerings that go to him in this moment, bless anyone who comes forward for prayer, bless us in the day we all have to occupy and the things that yet to be done, bless us in this week as we walk through your passion, may we reflect on your promise and your movement, and may we gather next week with an, ex with an expectancy that resurrection and its fullness in Christ could lay have laid hold of us, and we too would be those who would say, He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. And He is alive. And He is Savior, Lord, Redeemer, High Priest. So, Lord, bless us as we move forward now. Thank you for the patience and the love of everyone. Bless children's ministry, especially in Jesus' name. Amen.